victory thou or death hath won. Sandy, let us, in our call to worship on the flute, the bells have rung. I welcome you to worship on this second Sunday of the Easter season. Call your attention to the announcements on Wednesday's Zoom prayer meeting, 8 a.m. If you'd like to ever join us, want a link, contact me. Good News Club, 3.30 on Wednesday, and Lennox Session will be 7.30 on Wednesday night here at the church. Also, Sharpsburg is hosting our springtime Bible study. It's at the Spring General Store, and it starts at 3.15 on Thursday, and all of you are welcome to attend that as well. Are there additional announcements that need to be made? If not, join me in the Easter song. I'll play it for you. We'll sing it together. Rising like the morning sun, giving hope to everyone. Praise the Lord, His work is done. Jesus is my morning sun. There's a verse I'll sing in between. Join me. Rising like the morning sun, giving hope to everyone. Praise the Lord, His work is done. Jesus is my morning sun. Hiding in the upper room, His disciples filled
confess our sins together. We praise you, Lord Jesus, for your victory over sin and death, while also confessing that we are sinners. Therefore, we stand in need of your forgiving grace. As you offered grace and peace to many of your disciples on the first Easter, please offer it to us too. Grateful we are for your patience and love beyond measure. Empower us to live in such a way that others might know that we follow you. We offer this prayer in your powerful name. Our assurance of pardon comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 23. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Brothers and sisters, let us forgive one another that we might be forgiven and forgiveness might reign. I declare to you the truth, in and through Jesus Christ your sins are forgiven. So turn to your neighbors, pass the peace of Christ, saying, peace be with you. Younger people, forward for our children's message.
Right? I've got a special one for you. Here. Oops. I always get this number wrong. Anybody else get left out? Did you get left out? Ruby? Yeah, Ruby's got it. One for you. One for you. You may go to your seats. Thank you. I want to begin our joys and concerns by saying a big thank you to Christy, who's been our worship leader since this pandemic began, because she never knows what she's going to be asked to do. And she's always willing. Other joys and concerns to share today? Would you like to give us a report on Julie? She's fully awake. Julie, after her blood brain bleed, they tried twice to take out the ventilator, and because of the swelling of the vocal cords, it wasn't allowing her to breathe well enough, and so they had to put in a trait, but she's now doing extremely well. And this next week will be full of neurological testing. But we lift up Julie T in our special prayers and are delighted to have Savannah here with us along with the whole team family. Others to be remembered today. Uh, my mom, uh, they found out that she had something in her brain that uh, was causing the short-term memory loss and their uh, taking care of it, but she's still in recovery. Okay. Jacob's mother. And what's her first name? Naomi. Naomi. I should remember that. It's my oldest daughter's name. Others today to be remembered? For Ryder. And Val and Jake. We lift them all up. Okay. Linda's in a great deal of pain and we'll be seeing a surgeon shortly to, to contemplate if surgery is possible on her back. Linda Scholl. Right. Oh, we lift up Linda who has been a faithful worshiper with us by a live stream since the beginning facing a possible back surgery. We lift her up in special prayer. Also, like us to remember the Gridley family, the death of Marvin Gridley. Marvin's great grandchildren are part of our youth group here at Good News Club. And so we lift up the whole Gridley family as they mourn Marvin's death. Other Steve? Um, Deborah and Danielle and Hannah have a baby. Whoa! Devin and Danielle Sawyer, expecting another child. Yeah, we can clap for that. Ben Casey, who had surgery this week and is recovering well. As far as we know, okay. We lift up Ben after surgery and ag as she cares for him. Great. It's a joy to see Darlene. Ah. Darlene is back from Texas, and it's a joy at least for Craig. Yeah, yeah. You're here. I got here at 6 o'clock last night, so I did pretty good to get here, didn't you I? You did. <laughs> but Rosalie said she's coming, but I don't see her. <laughs> Maybe she got the time wrong. Anyway, <laughs> Darlene, it's great to have you back from Texas along with Rosalie. I was the Baptist all winter. I did very well. <laughs> you were a Baptist all winter, so good. I was a Baptist all winter and Presbyterian all summer. And I was raised at the Baptist, so it's very, you know, it's like home going down there, too. Perfect. But 
We all serve the risen Savior. Amen. We had a good minister. Amen. As same as we do here. Well, thank you. <laughs> Any other? You always throw me off my stride, darling. Right? Fred Haynes with the 90th birthday, we celebrate with Fred. Also, we should celebrate with uh, down at our Sharpsburg Church, uh, Clarence Immel celebrated a 100th birthday yesterday. And is part of his family and church down at Sharpsburg today. So we lift up the Haynes and the Immels after big birthdays. Prom went well. We think so. Somehow we're missing all our prom kids. <laughs> they didn't make it here, but it was a safe and good prom. We lift that up as a joy. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for your goodness and grace. We thank you for the gifts of your people and the willingness they have to use them. We thank you for our faithful musicians ushers, worship leaders, communion servers, and all who help in every way, including our candlelighters and bell ringers. Thank you, Lord, for this group of people here gathered to worship you. Now bless those who have come to worship, those who are watching live stream, and those who will watch later. Here are the prayers of your people as we pray for Julie as we pray for Jacob's mother, Naomi, as we pray for Rival and Val and Jake, as we pray for Linda Scholl, for the Gridley family, for Ben Casey, for Devin and Danielle and Harrison, for Darlene and all who are returning from the Southland, for Fred Haynes, Clarence Emble, and a safe prom, Lord, we lift up the children on the border. We lift up those in Iraq and in other places where there is war. We lift up the people of Myanmar. Hear the prayers of your people, O God, even as we pray the prayer you taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In your bulletins today, envelopes for the one great hour of sharing offering, which will be taken up this week, and next week, also banks. Some of them have come in. If you've got a bank to fill it up, bring it on back in. One great hour of sharing goes to help Presbyterian Hunger Program, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, which will be sponsoring a mission trip to Minnesota, leaving two weeks today. Places are filling up quick. If you're interested in going, you better let me know soon. Also, there's an offering plate in the back for our regular tithes and offerings. And thank you to those of you who have mailed them in. Okay. 19 through 29. Sandy will serve as narrator. Christy will speak for Jesus. And I will be doubting Thomas. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the, then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, 
We have seen the Lord. <laughs> but he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails in my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Lots of people have favorite Bible characters. But I have only known one person in my life whose favorite Bible character is Thomas, the one we usually call Doubting Thomas. This friend of mine is a bit of a skeptic. He never believes anything simply because others tell him he ought to believe or needs to believe in order to be considered a Christian. And before he believes anything, he likes to consider all the possibilities, including some possibilities that few, if any, other persons consider or think the way that he thinks. And he has little regard for those who just go along with the crowd to avoid ridicule, ridicule or to keep from suffering the consequences of their being different. Hence, my friend is a big fan of Thomas. Not just because he's a skeptic who won't believe till he sees with his own eyes, but because Thomas demands to see Jesus' wounds and to touch them. Thomas says, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in those marks and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Now some Christians regard doubting Thomas as a timid believer. As someone who's full of doubt, who's stubborn, who lacks faith. Because he won't listen to his fellow apostles and try to convince him that they have seen the Lord. But my friend, he thinks Thomas is making a theological statement about suffering. And when I questioned him about it recently, he told me this story, which being a bit of a skeptic myself, I confirmed through my own research. Jürgen Moltmann was drafted into the German army at age 18 in the middle of World War II. He was sent to the Eastern Front where Russians and Germans were engaged in an epic battle that is not well remembered in the United States since our fighting men and women were not involved. The German army lost the battle and lost the war. Moltmann surrendered to Allied soldiers and spent the next three years of his life in prisoner of war camps. It was there in prisoner of war camps that he met up with sincere Christians who convinced him of the power of Jesus Christ, of his crucifixion and resurrection. And Moltmann became a devout Christian. He wrote later, I did not find Christ in the POW camp. Christ found me. He decided to become a pastor. And so he went to seminary, but there he was greatly disappointed. You see, most of his seminary professors had fled Germany 
during the war stayed in places of safety until Hitler was defeated, the war was over, and then they came back. Moltmann says they tried to teach me about the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Their words seemed hollow to me, for they had not been willing to lay down their lives. He couldn't see their wounds, the scars in their hands and side. So what Moltmann did was find a theologian who had been through it, one Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who had fled the seminary, but then come back to be with the German people in the midst of this terrible war. He had joined a plot to try to assassinate Adolf Hitler. Bonhoeffer was thrown into jail, kept there for several years until as the Allies were on the verge of winning, Bonhoeffer was killed by orders of Hitler. And not before he smuggled out some of his writings. In the writings of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Jürgen Moltmann found meaning because Bonhoeffer had suffered. He had laid down his life for Christ. Moltmann later wrote a book entitled The Crucified God, in which he maintained that Jesus not only died for the sins of the world, but for all who suffer unjustly, for all the oppressed, for all those who suffer because of the sinfulness of humanity. Thus, when Jesus rose from the dead, Moltmann argued, he carried in his resurrected body the marks of his own suffering as a reminder that we have a God who does not take away our suffering, but who suffers with us as we suffer. Wow. When preparing this sermon, I didn't actually intend to get in such detail about two German Christian theologians but it seems to me that their teachings are important to us even today. As we live in a world in which unjust suffering is rampant, causing some to wonder if God even cares or exists. Today's gospel reading might help us understand how much Jesus does care about our suffering, and not only about our suffering, but our doubts and our fears. Jesus, 12 chosen, now reduced to 11. They were filled with fear after Jesus' crucifixion. They were the ones most at risk for being next. So they were hiding in a locked upper room. There Jesus came to them, speaking peace and showing them his hands and side. Apparently the resurrected Christ was not fully healed. Or at least he bore the scars of being nailed to the cross and stabbed with a spear. In other words, he had gotten through the crucifixion, but not over it. You understand, don't you, the difference between getting through something and getting over something? People are always asking me, how long does it take to get over a stroke, over a heart attack, over the death? of a spouse, a parent, a child? If I answered truthfully, and sometimes I say little, I would say, you don't get over such things. You just get through them as best you can with the help of God, and you always carry with you the wounds and scars of your ordeal. I also get asked, why does God allow these things to happen to my loved one? Why doesn't God do something to alleviate the suffering of the children of the world? Again, I rarely attempt to answer why questions because I don't know the answers. But I do know that God doesn't abandon us in the midst of our suffering. 
When Jesus was on the cross, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The sense of being forsaken by God is something even Jesus felt. The God did not abandon Jesus. God raised him up from dead on the third day. And God promises to give us new life, too. Did you notice what Jesus told his disciples to do? When he appeared to them and spoke peace, he breathed on them and gave them instructions about forgiveness, warning them that if they didn't forgive, then those sins would be retained, and retained sins always cause trouble. If you don't believe me, then think about how you feel when you won't forgive someone. When you remember what they've done to you, but you refuse to forgive, does that make you feel more loving or compassionate? Or does it fill you with hardness or bitterness? It's truly hard to forgive someone who has wounded you, especially when you didn't deserve it. But it's even harder to carry that pain the rest of your life. Jesus calls us to forgive and move on. Again, you'll never get over certain pains, but you can get through them with God's help. That's why Jesus appeared to Mary and Peter and Thomas and others to help them through the pain and suffering so that they could love one another and God. Thomas found it hard to believe that Jesus, who had died a terrible death, could come back to life. But Jesus did not believe, leave Thomas in his doubts and fears. He came to him. In the same way, Jesus comes to all who suffer and abides with those in pain. We don't have to find Jesus as we wander around in our prisoner of war camps, held prisoner by our griefs and sorrows. We are invited to allow Jesus to find us. And he will find us and help us through to the other side. Enough. I have a gift for you today. Not for me, but from Jesus Christ. It's the gift of Holy Communion, an opportunity to remember the sufferings of Christ and his triumph over sin and death. All are invited to partake of this gift, for it is a gift of grace. Come, let us gather around the table that we might share this gift together. Elders serving on session, please come forward. here gathered and at home. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. Men and women will come from north and south and east and west and gather around this table of the kingdom of God. As a foretaste of that feast, we celebrate today, remembering that on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord took bread, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. In the same manner also, he took of the cup. And he poured, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant of my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we remember Jesus' death until he comes again. Let us pray. Lord God, you created us good, but we have fallen into sin. But in and through Jesus Christ, you showed us the way to eternal life. For Christ lived for us, died for us, rose for us, and intercedes for us now. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these common elements and upon all the elements and all the houses tuned into this service. May your blessing be added to it, that they might represent for us the body and blood of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. The body of Christ, 
Please hold the bread till all have been served, that we might eat together. Regular bread on the outside, gluten-free in the middle, for all who are gluten-free. Elders.
Our closing hymn is hymn number 58, Crown Him With Many Crowns. Stand as we sing together.